Hi everyone. Welcome. Welcome all. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lisa Mendez, Director of Programs at the Miami Book Fair. I want to take this opportunity to thank our Book Fair and Books and Books staff for the great work they do year round on behalf of authors and readers everywhere. And I want to remind you all that every book you purchase through our link right here on this page supports our beloved independent books and books and our local economy. Please note, we will be taking uh, questions from the audience, from you all, um, throughout uh, this event. Toward the, toward the end, um, all your questions will be answered, so please feel free to type them into the Ask a Question field right at the bottom of the page. Um, I'm very much looking forward to tonight's conversation. And to introduce our guests, I present to you Catherine Grieve. Catherine is a friend of the fair. Um, for those of you don't, who don't know, uh, Friends is our membership group. We invite you to join. Um, and Catherine is a beloved supporter. She's been uh, supporting the fair for a long time. And um, in addition to her membership with Friends of the Fair, she volunteers as a member of the fair's board of advisors. Uh, Thank you so much, Catherine, for your work on our behalf. And in just a second, I will uh, get Catherine up on our screen to um, introduce our guests. Thanks, Lizette. Pulitzer Prize winning biographer Kai Bird traces the arc of Jimmy Carter's administration from his aggressive domestic agenda to his controversial foreign policy record. Taking readers inside the Oval Office, Byrd shows how issues still hotly debated today, from national health care to increasing inequality and racism to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, burned hotly in Carter's America and consumed a president who had a moral obligation to solve them. Kai Bird is a distinguished historian. His works include biographies and critical writings on the Vietnam War, Hiroshima, nuclear weapons, the Cold War, the Arab-Israeli conflict, and the CIA. In January 2017, he was appointed the Executive Director and Distinguished Lecturer for CUNY Graduate Center's Leon Levy Center for Biography. His last book, The Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames, was a New York Times bestseller. Tonight, he will be in conversation with historian Douglas Brinkley, the Catherine Sanoff Brown Chair of Humanities and Professor of History at Rice University, CNN's presidential historian and a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. In the world of public history, he serves on boards, at museums, at colleges, and for historical societies. The Chicago Tribune dubbed him America's new past master. Brinkley is a member of the Century Association, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the James Madison Society of the Library of Congress. We hope you all enjoy tonight's conversation. And with that, let's get started. Um, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great. <laughs> uh oh, my favorite historians. He's an incredible biographer and a teacher and public intellectual. And I also happen to have a big interest in Jimmy Carter personally. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and grew up there. And Jimmy Carter's book, Why Not the Best, it meant a lot to me when I was young. I love that Carter wore a blue jean jacket and was shown shoveling peanuts and ads and liked Bob Dylan and uh, and Dylan Thomas. So I've been firing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, following President Carter for really decades. And I've been waiting for somebody to do a book like Kai did that uses the newest archival material available with the instincts of somebody who understands journalism, politics, and history. So I urge everybody to get Outlier. And let me begin, Kai, by asking you the title. Why do we you call uh, Jimmy Carter an outlier? Well, I like punchy short titles. And this one seems to describe 
Jimmy Carter very well. He was, you know, an outlier even in Plains, Georgia, where he grew up, and in Archer even more so. He, where he was, you know, practically the only white boy in that tiny little hamlet about two miles down the road from Plains. But he was an outlier on, as a young man, on the issue of race. As a Southern white man, he always had a, a very liberal and egalitarian attitude on race. Uh, he was. He was the only politician, you know, in the 1960s and 70s who really felt comfortable walking into a black church. And, and uh, he, you know, he knew those people. They were his friends. He was completely comfortable in African-American culture. So he was an outlier. He was an outlier when he came to uh, the White House. He really sort of avoided the Georgetown set. <laughs> he, he uh, you know, famously turned down dinner invitations from Catherine Graham, the, editor, the publisher of the Washington Post. He was considered by the sort of foreign policy establishment as, you know, an outlier. But the outlier, the word itself, it, to me, also signifies uh, a conscious decision to be different. And it's based on, you know, an, a conscious, intelligent decision to be different and to uh, and that that also describes Jimmy Carter to a T. Yeah, it's um, he, he, when he became president, he actually said the Democratic Party was an albatross around my neck. <laughs> right. And he ended up alienating the Ted Kennedy wing of the Democratic Party and the more conservative Scoop Jackson wing. Um, what are the political costs of being a maverick or going to the beat of your own drum, as Henry David Thoreau used to say? Well, there's a high cost to it. And uh, Carter's political career is a great example of it. You know, Doug, you I know you were friends with uh, the famous gonzo journalist Hunter Thompson, who uh, when he first met Carter or saw him perform, give a, give a speech, an off the cuff speech at what was called the Law Day event in Atlanta, I think in 1974, he was witnessing Ted Kennedy give a talk and Jimmy Carter, and he was blown away by Carter and uh, described him, I think, as the meanest politician he'd ever met. Now, that's not exactly a description that you know, most Americans today would would uh, associate with Carter, but he was a driven, relentless politician who knew how to get elected. But he also, as you know, once he got elected governor to, in a one-term governorship in Georgia, uh, he had done what was necessary to win that, that race, uh, walking right up to the line of dog whistles on racial issues. And then on the day of his inauguration, he stunned everyone by announcing that the time for segregation in the South was over. Uh, and, you know, he proceeded to alienate a lot of his constituency in Georgia as a governor, uh, appointing numerous African-Americans to the civil service jobs in the state and taking on tough issues, whether it's the environment or reorganizing the government. And he did the same thing in, in Washington. He had this attitude that uh, the only way to justify his am political ambitions was to, once he achieved power, was to do the right thing. And what he meant by doing the right thing was not political expediency. It was figuring out what the in most intelligent uh, policy position should be and then pursuing it. And he, he gradually sort of step by step <laughs> In his four years managed to alienate a lot of a lot of political constituencies from trade unions to as you mentioned the liberal wing of the democratic party with ted kennedy and uh the jewish voters because he took such a tough position on uh, the middle east uh, so he's an amazing politician a, a singular you know, you know an outlier you deal with it in your book of the distinctive southernness of jimmy carter and he emerged when the press was talking about the, the new South or Dixie whistling a new tune. What is, how does, or let me phrase it this way. How is Jimmy Carter being from Georgia, being a Southerner um, matter 
during his uh, presidency? Well, it was his hope that as a Southern white man elected to the White House for the first time in what 140 years from the Deep South, that he could heal the nation, heal the nation on race because of his p particular insights and, and progressive attitude on race, that he could heal the nation in the wake of the Watergate scandal and uh, the Vietnam War, that he could be a unifier. And, uh, but he brought to this mission a, a certain Southern sensibility that I wasn't familiar with. I'm, I'm a Yankee, I'm an expatriate American, if anything. And I really didn't understand the South when I began to get into this subject. But one of the lessons that I come, came away after writing this book was to realize that Carter, as a Southerner, like many Southerners, has a sense of defeat. He knows in his blood what it is to be defeated, meaning in the Civil War, to be uh, occupied uh, by a foreign army. Uh, so he has a sort of realistic, uh, pragmatic attitude about politics that uh, is not typical of the typical sort of liberal northern, say, a Ted Kennedy, who has this soaring idealistic rhetoric. Carter was very down to earth and pragmatic, and that was one of the reasons why it was hard to pin him down, is this guy a populist? Well, what kind of populist? Is it, he's a fit, small town fiscal conservative, but he wants to spend money on the poor. He's, uh, you know, he's very hard to pin down. And I think his presidency is defined by his southernness, as you suggest, both the promise, but also the defeat, because he, you know, he won in 76 with the support of the southern white man, and then he lost the South for just four years later, precisely because th that constituency decided to turn their back on his brand of progressive populism on particularly the racial issue, but on, you know, it, it wasn't only the whites who turned on him, it was evangelical Christians and the Jewish voter and labor unions. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, th this was all because of, some of his outlier stances on a host of political issues. You do a nice job, Kai, of dealing with William Faulkner and Rhino Niebuhr and other intellectual influences on uh, Jimmy Carter, but I'll let the readers and book buyers look into that part because we have so much to cover. Um, but tell me about his childhood, uh, the legendary Ms. Lillian, <laughs> and who is uh, Earl Carter, his father? What is he like? And what are the differences between those parents? Yeah, this is the, the mystery of, about Carter, a paradox. He's, uh, you know, coming from this tiny little hamlet in Archer and then Plains. Uh, it's the deep, deep South Georgia. It's a culture of segregation. And his father, uh, you know, was a businessman and landowner, probably fairly well off, in fact, owned several thousand acres. Um, but he, his father was a believer in white supremacy, you know, to put it bluntly. Um, and that wasn't unusual in those years, you know, in the, in the 30s and 40s when Carter was growing up. But he had Miss Lillian, who was completely very much an outlier, a, a uh, an eccentric Southern woman who uh, liked to provoke her neighbors by defending Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and she had no hesitation about, as a nurse, walking into a, a black home and uh, providing them health care. And she encouraged jo uh, Jimmy to have to play with African Americans throughout his childhood. And obviously, she was the influ influence on his political and cultural sensibilities. She was the outspoken one, the, the eccentric, the outlier, who was a, a social liberal in many ways. And Carter, you know, 
it, it's again, it's a mystery how he he acquired such driving ambition and uh, you know comes from Plains, Georgia High School and makes it to the Naval Academy and has a brilliant career in the Navy and then comes back to Plains when his father suddenly dies to take over the family business. And he's, you know, he loves that, that little town. It's, you know, even after four years in the White House, he went back to Plains and he's still living there today, um, and, you know, at the age of 96 in a very uh, unassuming ranch house. Um, you mentioned the U.S. Navy, and he's our only president to graduate from the Naval Academy in Annapolis. Well, while he was there, he encountered Admiral Rick Hyman Rickover. What's the backstory between the Carter Rickover relationship that goes on for quite some time? Yes, he was he was an influence, and uh, Carter himself, you know, wrote a lovely childhood memoir, um, and. He writes about the influence of Rick over over him, and he compares him to his father, uh, who was a very stern disciplinarian, and so was Rick over, and a very intimidating kind of character. And uh, yet he he also acquired from him the the uh, the phrase uh, of always doing your best. Uh, because that's the question that the admiral asked him when he first interviewed him for a job to join his uh, submarine division. Um, so Rickover was an influence, but you know they didn't actually work together that closely or for very long. Uh, Carter was sent off to study nuclear engineering, as he calls it, and uh, and then shortly, you know, within two years, he was he made the momentous decision to abandon his naval career to go back to Plains when his father died. So, it, And he, he, he had wanted to be a chief of naval operations uh, at one point, and he had his children born at different um, <laughs> military right. um, bases around the world. Uh, he got to go to the Pacific in the Pacific theater, and he was in a, a prototype nuclear submarine. Um, what would you say, is, if we were going to look at Carter as a military man, um, what, how did his Navy upbringing, if you like, um, reflect his view as a Cold War president? Well, that's another surprise uh, to me. Uh, you know, I think he, it, one of the lessons he acquired from being in the Navy for what was it, about seven years, uh, was he concluded, and this is why he he quit, and not only because his father suddenly died and he was needed back on the farm, but uh, he wondered, I think out of his religiosity, whether he wanted to spend his life devoted to a war machine and to uh, operating weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it, it's not that he was a pacifist. He wasn't a pacifist, but he he just realized that maybe the Navy wasn't for him, and he, he rankled under Navy discipline. Uh, he had several officers, co commanding officers, whom he clashed with. And, you know, again, this is, in retrospect, uh, it explains a lot about Jimmy Carter. He was not a man who... Uh, would suffer fool, fools gladly, and he was very impatient with uh, stupidity. And he, yeah, not surprisingly, he encountered quite a bit of that in the Navy. So I think he he used his Navy experience to come to what the White House, and uh, he brought with it a certain skepticism about the use of military force. So remarkably, you know, during his entire four years in office, he never. Um, never ordered a soldier into combat with the exception of the helicopter rescue mission, which was not really a, a combat situation, a, a foolish errand in my view, but uh, a plan that never would have worked. But And it, it indeed ended in disaster with a helicopter crash and, and the loss of life, but it wasn't in combat. So his he avoided combat, and that's actually an interesting theme in my book. I really um, 
unlike some some of the conventional writings about Car Carter, uh, I, I emphasize, in fact, his uh, differences with his own national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who uh, was constantly advising him to use military force, and Carter was constantly trying to avoid it and turn down Zbigniew's advice. And it's a it's a you know colorful story in the in the White House years. Yeah, you do a good job at that on Brzezinski, and you. You say at some point that maybe Carter was loyal, stayed loyal perhaps to Brzezinski because of a personal affinity and didn't want to dismiss him. Um, uh, the big topic of being from Georgia, 1954, Brown v. Topeka, uh, race in the news daily right now in America. Tell us Car about Carter's evolution on race. He had a white supremacist father. How does Carter navigate uh, through the 50s, 60s, and beyond uh, issues about civil rights and the, the black plight? Well, he, uh, in an astonishing way, he just kept his head down. You know, he, everyone in Plains knew that he had these liberal views about race, but he didn't go out of his way to antagonize his neighbors. He, uh, uh, and you know he never joined publicly in the civil rights movement. He had an opportunity to. He probably, you know, as a state senator elected in 1962, he could have met Martin Luther King, uh, but he didn't. He stayed away from that. And I think it was a conscious decision, a very almost Machiavellian decision, that if he wanted to have a political career in South Georgia, he had to keep his head down. So for instance, uh, I, I write a, quite a bit of, uh, in the early part of the book about uh, a neighbor down the road, seven miles from Plains, named Clarence Jordan, who happened to be the uncle of Hamilton Jordan. And Clarence Jordan had a, an extraordinary story. He was a, a radical minister um, who, you know, an ordained, uh, minister who a baptist uh who nevertheless had radical christian views let's say and in 1940 he established an an interracial commune seven miles down the road from plains um called koinonia and uh it survived again sort of under the radar until the brown uh decision was came down from the Supreme Court in 1954. And, and then they became the target of Ku Klux Klan attacks, dynamite attacks, machine gun attacks. And, you know, Carter knew all about this. And he knew Clarence. He admired Clarence. He quietly uh, made a point of bef befriending him and uh, breaking the boycott against Clarence Jordan's uh, farm. Uh, but, you know, he never publicly <laughs> did anything to, to advertise this, his affinity for Clarence. Uh, so, his, yes, he had, a, I think, I don't know if it was an evolution, you know, because I think he was always cultivated by his mother, Lillian, Miss Lillian, to have liberal views on race. But he he kept them hidden so that he could get elected. It's just, uh, and he did so until he was elected governor, and then he began running as a Southern liberal populist for the presidency. It was very clever and Machiavellian and calculated. Don't want to belabor his pre-presidential years too much, but I want one question about that governorship. It, besides um, showing uh, appointing so many African Americans to post in state government, which we've already touched on, what else made him such a unusual one-term governor? We look at how many times Bill Carton, uh, Bill Clinton, got elected from Arkansas, and here's <laughs> Carter, a one-termer from Georgia. How did he get national attention out of that platform? Uh, 
Well, I think he started, I, I argue he started running for the presidency quietly um, in 1971, 72. By 72, he was angling for uh, the nomination for the vice presidency. And he, uh, you know, he had, when, when he made that famous speech at, at his inauguration announcing that the time for segregation was over, uh, that spring, I believe, he, uh, his communications director, his public relations wizard, Jerry Rafshoon, a very colorful uh, ad man from Atlanta, um, uh, persuaded the Time magazine to put him on the cover as the example, the exemplar of the new, the new South. And that was a brilliant, you know, campaign move uh, to uh, prepare the way for his, his uh, under the radar ca campaign for the presidency. But yeah, it's a, it's a very improbable presidential campaign. I, you know, he, he was just very lucky that Ted Kennedy decided not to run. Uh, and then he faced a crowded field of politicians and uh, who were ostens ostensibly more liberal than him. So he, he could sort of claim the moderate ground. And then he w was brilliant enough um, to follow Hamilton Jordan's his, his key campaign aide, uh, his advice to uh, run hard in Florida and defeat George Wallace there, making him the only surviving candidate for the South, and then to win New, New Hampshire. And, uh, yeah, you know, again, in a very improbable way, he managed to seize the nomination. Now, once he did seize the nomination and he defeats Gerald Ford, uh, what were the key moments in 1976? Do you think it was the debate, um, you know, debating Gerald Ford when Ford made his blunder about being no Soviet influence in Poland and the like? Um, and and what was the, would you see the virtue? What did Carter do well on the campaign trail? He, uh, he followed the advice of his closest political mentor, Charlie Kerbo. And Kerbo is, uh, as you know, you probably met Kerbo. Were you, were you able to meet Kerbo? I got at one to point? meet a lot of those, uh, those guys, yes. <laughs> well, I never got a chance to meet Kerbo, but he, he was described to me many times as sort of the Attic Atticus Finch of yeah. the Carter operation, you know, the the, the uh, character in the novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, Kerbo was this very slow talking South Georgia attorney who was a trial attorney, you know, he, and uh, he spoke very softly and stayed in the back of the room and observed things. And then he would uh, give his opinion. Anyway, he was Carter's, uh, lawyer from 1962 onwards. And I have to, I can't resist telling the story uh, in my very first interview for this book with Carter uh, in it, in his office at the Carter center. Uh, you know, he's a difficult interview. He, he's impatient with stupid questions or familiar questions. And he's very punctual. He was only giving me 45 minutes for each of our sessions. <laughs> and uh Anyway, I managed to ask him about Kerbo, which was a good thing to do because uh, he loved Charlie Kerbo. And I pointed out to him that I couldn't find any of Kerbo's memos or letters in the presidential archive. And he, that got his attention. You know, those bright blue eyes lit up and, and he turned to his aide and said, well, we've got to find those papers because Charlie wrote me, you know, every week while I was in the White House and letters often before that. <clears throat> so three days later, I actually got a call from his aide and they had found five cardboard boxes of Kerbo letters and memos that apparently Kerbo had squirreled out of the White House after the November 1980 election and put in his attic. So they found he was 
he had passed on by then, but his widow was still alive and they, the boxes were in the attic. And so six months later, I got access to these papers and they were wonderful. They were just, you know, a window into Jimmy Carter's mind because here you have Kerbo telling him how to run. I'm getting back to your question about the 76 campaign. You know, he told him to run as a populist, but a moderate populist, you know, to talk about corporate America, but not to sound like an extremist, to uh, don't paint yourself as an anti-war candidate, you know, in the wake of the Vietnam War, but, uh, you know, paint yourself as a, a reasonable, likable man who is a man of integrity. So, you know, he urged him to run on his own personal, uh, uh, his own personal his own personality, his integrity, his, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> and so Carter did, but he also, I uh, famously remember he made part of his stump speech in 76. He, he always promised, I will never lie to you. And when Kerbo heard that, he uh, told Carter, uh, well, there goes the liar vote. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, no, he had a sense of humor. Contacts Kerbo with Coca Cola and other other you know Atlanta corporations. He he knew what he was doing. Yeah. The presidency of Carter. I'm going to mention some of what we'll call his accomplishments. And uh, tell me, you know, a backstory or an observation about them. Camp David Accords. How important is that in the history of Middle East and actually world peace in general? Yeah, no, it's an incredible episode. Uh, it's a hallmark of his whole foreign policy. It was, without a doubt, his greatest achievement in, on, in the field of foreign policy. And it was entirely personal diplomacy. He brought these two contentious, difficult personalities to Camp David for 13 days, Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin, the newly elected prime minister of Israel. And uh, he just, you know, he kept them apart because he knew they would just argue. And then he shuttled back and forth between their cabins and ironed out a, uh, uh, what's called the Camp David Accord. Now, my book, I, I argue against the conventional wisdom in one respect about the, the uh, Camp David Accords. The conventional wisdom has it that what Carter achieved was essentially a separate peace between Israel and Egypt. And that's true. He got uh, Sadat to agree to withdraw from the Sinai and uh, to recognize Israel. And they exchanged ambassadors eventually. Oh, you know, it took a while. but uh, And it is a cold peace 40 years later to, to, this, to this day. But the conventional wisdom has that it was a separate peace and that it, didn't, it failed to address the central issue uh, of the conflict, which is the, the plight of the Palestinian refugees and the Palestinian desire for self-determination. And in fact, he, I argue that uh, if you look at his diaries and the record of the Camp David negotiations and the newly declassified documents, Carter, you know, with his attention, his engineer's mind and attention to detail, he actually was quite aware of this. And he insisted on getting a promise from Menachem Begin to have a five-year freeze on all settlement activity in the West Bank. Uh, and he fully understood, and it's clear from his diary, that he expected that it in with such a freeze, over five years, the Palestinians would gradually prove themselves as self-governing, and this would lead to uh, Palestinian self-determination, i.e. a two-state solution. Begin agreed, I, I argue, Begin was reluctantly agreed to a side letter stipulating this, and then he pulled a fast one and he substituted a different letter. Carter rejected it, they argued, but by this time they were on their way to the White House ceremony. And for, for decades afterwards, Carter believed that Begin had uh, lied to him, that he had uh, promised him this, 
it was a key point it, and uh, it would have meant a resolution of the Palestinian Israeli conflict and instead 40 years later we are still wrestling with this very serious problem did um Carter, I think Camp David, everybody who agrees was a great thing. But during his post-presidency, when he wrote a book, some people thought he was favoring the PLO, Yasser Arafat, or, or was um, talking about Israel as an apartheid state. People like Alan Dershowitz and others really going after President Carter hard. Was there any sign of anti-Semitism in Carter? Did he... Uh, it, why does he remain unpopular in Israel today? Yes, no, he's he's practically a pariah in Israel, probably. I, you know, no, uh, I think the charge of anti-Semitism is ridiculous. You know, Carter doesn't have a prejudicial bone in his body, uh, and the, even the charge of being anti-Israeli is uh, really unfair. Again, coming back to what happened at Camp David, Carter understood that if there was going to be peace, you had to address the Palestinian issue. Not necessarily even a two-state solution. He wasn't talking about that in the beginning uh, or during his presidency, but self-determination, autonomy, you know, those are code words for what everyone knew would come down the road eventually. Um, and he thought it was in Israel's long-term self-interest and its long-term legitimacy um, to not build settlements. If you build settlements, if you establish 700,000 settlers in the West Bank, which is now what we're facing, it's going to be very hard to divide the land. We'll have a, a separate Palestinian state. And that means that Israel becomes a majority Palestinian state if they actually were to annex the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and provide citizenship to all those Palestinians, the Palestinians would be in the majority. So, you know, this this road that the Israeli right wing, the Likud politicians took over the last four decades was a, a road to a dead end in Carter's view. And he constantly, you're right, he tried to persuade Yasser Arafat to, um, go for a political solution. And so he was willing to meet with Arafat. You know, Carter was the kind of guy who was willing to meet with anyone if he thought it would lead to peace. Um, so this got him into a lot of trouble. And you're right, in 2007, he wrote a book. You know, he's written over 30 books, but uh, he wrote a book about the Middle East uh, with the, the title, uh, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid not apartheid, <laughs> but he, he used the word apartheid in the title and this got him into a lot of trouble with people like Alan Dershowitz and you know members of his own board of trustees at the Carter Center resigned, his own Middle East advisor resigned, uh, Stu Eisenstadt, his close former aide for a domestic advisor, a long-term lawyer. Um, Stu, you know, tried at the time to persuade Carter to take out the word apartheid from the title. But Carter refused. He wanted to provoke. He wanted to provoke a discussion. And he got it. <laughs> yeah. What about the Panama Canal Treaty? Well, this is another example of Carter sort of uh, refusing to follow the advice of his political advisors. And... Uh, who all told him that this was not a politically expedient thing for him to expend any political capital on as uh, early in his presidency, but he made it a priority in, from day one to tackle a Panama Canal Treaty because he thought it was necessary and the right thing to do. And he got it through narrowly, passed, ratified by the Senate, but it, at great political cost because two years later, seven of those senators who he twisted the arms of to the vote in confirmation of the treaty, uh, lost their election. So it, it, and you know, he, he did this repeatedly, which helps to explain why he was only a one-term president. And my last question, cause we're gonna open it up there, ones that are coming in, uh, but in 19, 
80, he not only lost, he got uh, uh, killed in a landslide by Ronald Reagan and many liberal Democrats lost their Senate seats. How much is Carter responsible for that kind of landslide? Uh, was this outlierness, this refusal to control or lead the Democratic Party? Uh, because you and I could go on here for, for a long time marking off accomplishments, human rights, or you know, uh, Alaska lands, uh, right. you know, creating of new government agencies like FEMA. We could keep on going, but yet he got really trounced in 1980. Why? Well, you know, Carter actually believed up until about 10 days before the election that he had a fighting chance. He was within 5% in many of the polls, which is the margin of error. Um, he couldn't believe that Ronald Reagan, this two-bit B-movie actor from Hollywood and right-wing Republican governor of California could possibly beat him. He had, you know... Uh, the usual Carter self-confidence. Um, but he had been greatly weakened by uh, Ted Kennedy and Ayatollah Khomeini. So Ted Kennedy decided to run against him uh, using the, their dispute over health care as the campaign issue that divided them. And uh, again, this is an example of Carter trying to do the right thing. He too favored national health insurance, but uh, and he had campaigned on it in 76, but once in office, the fiscal conservative in, in him decided that it was, Kennedy's bill was too expensive. So he proposed a compromise, a national catastrophic health insurance, just to cover major health expenditures. Um, Kennedy wouldn't go for it. The trade unions, labor unions wouldn't go for it. And so Kennedy used it to run against him, um, saying that he had reneged on health insurance. And, uh, you know, Kennedy was a bad campaigner. Carter was, as Hunter Thompson described him, he could be a mean politician, he could be tough, and he was determined to, quote, whip Kennedy's ass. And he did, but it was a long drawn out battle and it greatly weakened him by the time he arrived at the convention in that, that summer. Um, and then of course the Iran hostage crisis lasted for 444 days. Uh, Carter refused to use military force because he thought this would endanger the lives of the hostages. And he was increasingly painted in the press uh, as ineffectual and weak. And uh, the press had a, you know, went overboard in their sort of post-Watergate era of investigative journalism. They also made fun of him. I mean, Sally Quinn in the style section of the Washington Post uh, uh, really went after his Southern accent, his Southern demeanor, his uh, sort of outlier status in terms of the social, you know, the Georgetown set in Washington society. and. He was painted as ineffectual, which is, uh, again, I think uh, any historian who looks at the, the record of all the accomplishments, he passed a lot of legislation that was very con consequential. Um, anyway, he, he lost, uh, and he was, in fact, you're right, trounced. And uh, even his own southern base turned on him, and that was particularly painful to him. But I think, again, coming back to his significance as a president, uh, it, it was a tipping point, a turning point. And yes, the American people rejected Jimmy Carter. And I think that actually says more about American people than it does about Jimmy Carter. You know, they chose to go down for the next few decades down a very conservative path. They chose to reject the, uh, Ra progressive racial views that Carter had talked about. And, uh, and we, you know, that was, that says something about American society and the political culture of, of the 1980s and 90s, more so than Carter. Carter is who he is. He's, you know, he's a great ex-president, but he's a great ex-president precisely because he's 
uh, he worked very hard uh, to on his unfinished presidency, as the subtitle of my book is. Uh, you know, he he wanted to continue the good works that he was doing in the White House. Anyway, I go on too long. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. We have a, a one question about the malaise speech. Is it true that he never used the word malaise? Is the question right? Yeah, the the malaise word never appeared in the speech. And uh, again, it's sort of a misunderstood speech. If you read it today, it's actually quite prescient and and evocative, and uh, it, it it's calling upon Americans to realize in a in a uh, realistic way that there are limits. He uh, warned against the sort of soaring rhetoric that we we would get used to with Ronald Reagan about a city on a hill and American exceptionalism. Well, again, it's the, it's the Southerner in him speaking, the man who knew defeat, who knew that there are material limits in this world, that there are environmental limits. He was talking about the environment and, and he was talking about the sort of narcissistic culture of me, me, me. Uh, and he, he was trying to emphasize community. Uh, it was a terrific speech that resonates today, but it never used the word malaise. Here, one question here is about human rights, and um, they're questioning whether he invented the term human rights. I believe no, that was Roosevelt. And, no, I don't think he long, invented it. Long, yeah, yeah, Roosevelt did that, and Eleanor. <laughs> Eleanor and Franklin yeah. probably didn't get credit for that, but, but he certainly put human rights, you know, at the center uh, as the, the lodestone of, of U.S. foreign policy. And, you know, he got a lot of criticism in the press and from uh, some Republican quarters that this was naive or overly idealistic and not pragmatic. And, but, uh, you know, no one has, none of his successors have been able to walk back from the notion that, U.S. foreign policy should, in as insofar as practical, should be uh, pay attention to the notion of human rights. Um, here's one about what surprised you the most in writing your biography about Jimmy Carter. What surprised me the most? Yeah. What after what I get, but it's that simple. But yes, um, you know, what preconception did you have of Carter? that now after you've done all this research, you realized you were wrong about, or that, you know, <laughs> a, an element that's really surprised you? Uh, I guess, you know, his, his relentlessness, his, uh, you know, the, the image Americans have of this great ex-president who goes around the world doing good things, is that he's a sort of wishy-washy liberal uh, humanitarian, not hard-headed. Well, that's completely wrong. He's uh, he's a very tough character. <laughs> he's very, you know he's uh, very sharp, even in his well into his nineties now. Um, he's very well read, very intelligent. You know, I found myself intimidated by trying to interview him. He's, <laughs> uh, you know, as I said earlier, he's impatient with the familiar question. And uh, and so he, I, I, I was astonished by how tough he was. Okay. Here's one that, um, what sites that one could visit in Plains, Georgia, best show the real Jimmy Carter? Uh, well, you got to go to his boyhood home in Archer and uh, see this Sears and Roebuck kit house that his father built uh, in the 1930s. They, <clears throat> you know, until Carter was 12 or 13, they they had no running water in the house. They had no electricity. Um, his father built a windmill at one point that pumped water into the house finally. And uh, I remember walking through this, you know, you can see the house as it would have existed in the 1930s. And you go into the 
uh, bathroom and there is a shower but it's a uh, tin bucket uh, with a bunch of nail holes punched through it <laughs> hanging from a hose. And, you know, it's a very crude. <laughs> so this, this underscores, you know, that Jimmy Carter is the president who came, from, came to us in the 20th century, really from, my God, the 19th century or 18th century. You know, he grew up on this farm that was, where mules were still used to pull the plows and everything was done by hand labor. And, uh, you know, his father would send him out uh, on July, July 4th with a shotgun to shoot a dozen hogs and string them up by their, their hind legs and, and quarter them. And I, you know, this was, this is a very sort of primitive farming existence. <laughs> and they, they made a good life out of it, but it was it was another universe in my eyes. Yeah, I was impressed by the job the National Park Service has done in Plains of kind of trying to capture what it would have been like, um, yeah. with, you know, pre-electricity and then when Carter was um, born. Um, wh wh what is, Plains mean to Jimmy Carter? It's, it's sort of like independence with Harry Truman. What strength does he get from that community life? Well, it's, you know, there's not much in Plains. It's like, you know, it's like one street with a few stores. And uh, I, I guess, you know, Billy Carter's gas station used to be there. There's the, the high school that he attended that's now become a museum. Um, you know, the whole place has really become a, a museum. There are still about 650 residents. Um, his own house he built in 1960, uh, very modest four bedroom ranch house. Um, and that too is gonna be turned over to the park service. But yeah, he, he decided after the White House to go back to Plains uh and you know he loves it uh it's and the church and the church there i think right the yeah, ability the church. to do yeah he was you know still giving sunday school sermons until a few um well until the pandemic hit and uh <clears throat> you know he loves planes i think he loves the earth the farmland uh yeah, he's not a city boy, uh, not at all. We'll do the last question here, but you can go on a little bit about it because it's a question about what part of his ex-presidency has made him such a remarkable global figure? Like, what has he actually done as ex-president to, you know, achieve these laurels from around the world? <laughs> Well, Doug, you should really answer that question. You've written a whole uh, yeah. presidency. <laughs> I did, but but I love your take on you know the different aspects of it. Uh, that what what impresses you about his post presidency? Actually, before I wrote about it, Kai, you did for the Nation uh, um, a while back. So you've been thinking about Carter as ex president for quite a while. Now that that's true. I wrote a cover story for the Nation uh, on the fabulous ex-presidency of Jimmy Carter. This is in 1990. And I did it because uh, I, it, occurred, it, it occurred to me after I finished my first biography about John McCloy that maybe I wanted to do Jimmy Carter. So this was, you know, 1990, uh, 30 years ago. And uh, I went down to Atlanta and interviewed a bunch of his aides at the Carter Center, which was just then opening up. And I learned, you know, about his uh, really large ambitions to, you know, have health programs in Africa to wipe out guinea worm disease and, and uh, other horrendous diseases that were not being addressed, specifically targeted um, by other international organizations. And you know, it was very impressive and uh, and his uh, his willingness to sort of 
jump in again to the Middle East problem and try to broker peace there and on Korea and uh, you know he he's habitat for humanity the, and the habitat but you know what admired me what made me admire him most was his fearlessness I mean he would go to North Korea to try to broker a peace uh, over the nuclear thing and he wasn't afraid to you know he knew he was going to get a lot of political flack for meeting with Yasser Arafat um, but he he didn't care um, so I admire him for that in particular um, no I think he's just a really admirable ex-presidency I mean you know the fact that he has not taken uh, $200,000 speech fees like some ex-presidents. Uh, he, you know, hasn't enriched himself. He's still living in the same house. Uh, when he goes to the Carter Center, he and, and Rosie, as he calls her, uh, live in a studio, uh, one little room with a, a uh, pull-down bed. Uh, you know, he's a very, uh, he's an odd combination of a very um, self-confident, almost arrogant, but self-effacing and uh, man with a lot of humility. So it, it, he's very hard to figure out in that way. But that well, makes You, you figured effort. him out very well, Kai. You did an incredible <laughs> job of taking one of our most important humanitarians and you know global states persons and an important u.s president and bringing him to life and letting us understand his policies his thinking his personality you did it all in the outlier i urge everybody listening here to get this book uh, read about jimmy carter he's still a national treasure that's with us but this is a book that will really get you understanding this remarkable american story Thank you, Kai. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this. Um, it was a lot of fun, and I salute you, Kai, for a job well done. Thank, thank you, Doug. This has been fun. Thank yes. you both. Thank you for being part of our program tonight, Books and Books and Mammy Book Fair. Um, all our fans and our staff and our, you know, everyone are um, part of Miami Day College. We are grateful for your participation, and we're. You know, just it's it's great to have this book, and I'm looking forward to reading it. And I hope to see you both again very soon in person next time. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, and uh, for everyone Bye, out there, don't forget you could purchase your book right on the link at uh, the at the bottom of the screen. And I also dropped links for um, uh, other uh, books that Kai uh, Bird has written, as well as uh, to Douglas Brinkley, uh, Brinkley's last book, which he presented at Miami Book Fair. Um, the year it came out. So thank you all, and we'll see you soon. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Good night.